Dr. Fabrizio, and she's going to be talking about putting a, a genie back in the bottle. So a metaphor, <laughs> I guess? I'm stepping into it. All right. So uh, the story of the genie in the bottle is well known to, to many of us, um, mostly because it, it talks about the idea of granting three wishes. But sometimes we get our wishes, and uh, there could be a price that we pay for those. So the story is based on um, some tales from the Arabian Nights, and probably the part that we all remember is the part where uh, the genie says, if you let me out of the bottle, I will grant you three wishes. And in fact, this is the story of the blue catfish in the Chesapeake Bay region, where in this story now, the blue catfish plays the genie, and the wishes are granted to uh, fisheries managers in the region. So these are the wishes. First, we want to establish a recreational fishery in Virginia. And so we're going to pick something that's highly targeted. We're going to pick something that grows quickly so we can get that fishery up and running. Secondly, we want to provide opportunities to catch a large fish, because we don't want to just catch small ones. We want some big fish. And then while we're at it, why don't we attract some out-of-state anglers and bring some economic revenue to the region? And so these were the three wishes that were granted. So to take a look at this story, we need to go back and look at where these fish came from. As you know, blue catfish are native to uh, the Mississippi, Missouri, uh, and Ohio River drainages. And they were brought into uh, the Chesapeake Bay region, which is shown on the right here. Uh, the triangles are the areas where they were stocked in Virginia, in the Rappahannock, the York, and the James River. The map shows you uh, salinity, uh, where the uh, seawater is in red, so very high salinity and the light blue uh, signifies freshwater. So they were introduced into the freshwater tidal uh, tributaries of Virginia. <clears throat> but since that time, um, there's been an increase in relative abundance of blue catfish. And we have a long-term uh, survey that we conduct in these rivers. This is the index of abundance for those three river systems, James, Rappahannock, and York. You saw these before. Uh, Vasker showed you the James and the York. Uh, we put in here the Rappahannock as well. But you can see that that has been increasing through time. But if we take a closer look at this now, and we did a survey, uh, we did a study, sorry, it was a mark recapture study in the James River, in one portion of the James River, a 12 kilometer stretch of the river, um, where we found that uh, the po possible population size was 1.6 million fish. Uh, and these are fish between 260 and 460 millimeters fork length. So this is the size uh, structure, the, the, the principal size of, of fish that we see in these systems. So you might think, well, what does that represent? Is that a lot? Is it not a lot? 12-kilometer uh, stretch of the river, 1.6 million fish translates to about 544 fish per hectare. That's about one to two to three to four orders of magnitude higher than many other native fishes that are now being controlled for in other parts of the uh, country. So if we look at the river system, because they're not just stuck in that 12-kilometer stretch, um, between Richmond and Burwell Bay, where we typically catch them in our trawl surveys, um, and we just kind of take that estimate of 544 fish per hectare, we come up with an estimate of almost 20 million fish in the James River alone. So that's a really high number of fish. So with those high numbers, we have the development of a, a really strong recreational fishery um, for blue catfish in the region, including the establishment of guiding services that will, folks that will take you out to catch a large fish. And uh, here's a trophy fishery. Uh, this is the trophy fish from the James River weighing in just a little over 102 pounds. So we have these really nice fisheries in our region. In addition to the recreational fisheries, there's been a development of commercial uh, small-scale fisheries. We call them watermen on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, these are folks that make a living on small boats. They go out and catch fish. This shows you the harvest from Virginia only. Um, we can also include the harvest from Maryland in here, <clears throat> and it would just about double. But what you see is through time, that harvest has increased. In fact, in the last three to four years, this harvest in terms of pounds of blue catfish exceeds the number of pounds of striped bass that we're pulling out of the system. Okay. <clears throat> there's been an unintended consequence as well. So you've seen this uh, image before from uh, Vosker's work and Corbin as well. 
Uh, the dark brown areas show you where blue catfish have now become established. Uh, the triangles show you where they were introduced. You can see that uh, they've moved around throughout this system. What's uh, really interesting, though, in the last couple of years, we've had some very wet um, conditions in the Chesapeake Bay, lots of rain coming down. And we have now captured them in the main stem of the bay proper, which has been unprecedented. This is the first time we've ever seen this. Those blue dots, however, represent 63 fish total. So I don't want you to think that the bay has got 19 million fish. No. Um, so 63 fish, though, were captured there. Part of the reason that uh, we see this happening is uh, because they have a, a pretty high salinity tolerance. This was some work that Bosker has done in the past, um, looking at salinity tolerance of blue catfish in uh, a laboratory experiment. And what we found was that fish can survive exposures up to 15.7 parts per thousand seawater uh, for 72 hours. Um, so this shows you the uh, mortality curve of the predicted survival from zero at high, <coughs> high salinity. Well, I don't know how to use this thing. OK, zero at high salinity to one at uh, fresh water or, or zero salinity. So you see that some uh, that around 10 to 20 is where they start to um, uh, experience mortality, um, but they certainly can survive up to 15.7. The, um, the other part of this project that we noticed was that the larger fish tend to um, survive or tolerate higher salinities better than the smaller fish. And it's these large, larger fish that are more likely to be moving around in the system. Um, we take that information now from the salinity tolerance experiment, and we can project a suitable habitat map. And this is what we're showing here. Now, this is not salinity here, but what we're showing is the probability of survival for blue catfish based on the data that I just showed you from that salinity tolerance experiment. So zero or no, no survival is red. And, and that's what you see for um, out here in the lower Chesapeake Bay. But what you can see is that um, a large part of the tip top of the bay here is a uh, very suitable habitat, and, uh, as are all these bluer areas here. And all the tributaries are separate from one another. Now, that's what it looks like when we have fairly dry conditions in the bay. What happens when we have wet conditions, like we saw in 2018 and 2019? Well, the picture changes dramatically. Now we see that these systems are actually now interconnected. We see the mouth of the Potomac River is, is wide open here, so fish have a full run of the upper part of the bay. And that's why we saw the fish that we did in the middle of the bay in 2018 and 2019. <clears throat> there have been some unintended consequences in terms of competition with our native fishes. Um, here, uh, I'm showing you a plot if you haven't seen these before, but this is the blue catfish abundance on the top, which we looked at, and now the white catfish, which is our native catfish species in the system. The white catfish is also um, tolerant of salinity, almost like blue catfish. So you see that there's, uh, as the blue catfish has increased, we are losing uh, abundance of the white catfish from these systems. Uh, we heard a little bit this morning from Corbin about predation. Um, these fish will uh, consume whatever is available, and in our system it happens to be things like blue crabs, which support a major commercial fishery, and allocenes, which have been uh, in decline along the entire Atlantic coast. So species like shad and alewife and blueback herring are consumed. And even though the percent by occurrence and the percent by weight of allocenes in the stomachs of these fish is, is kind of small, kind of low, uh, you have to keep in mind that there's a lot of fish in the system. The third effect that was unintended here is now, and it's a really interesting one here, is an interference with our gill net fisheries and pound net fisheries for other species. So these are gill net and pound net fisheries for things like striped bass, Atlantic croaker, and other species. And this is a photo from the Potomac River, and what you see here, these guys were out for striped bass, but all they caught was catfish. So over the side it goes. So this kind of interference is uh, not welcomed. And so in 2011, uh, the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission declared that the blue catfish was invasive, and it had potential to negatively affect a lot of the species that are managed by the ASMFC, including shad and alewife, blueback herring, and striped bass. 
And furthermore, uh, they declared that all practicable efforts should be made to reduce the population levels and to uh, reduce the range expansion of this invasive blue catfish. <clears throat> so what we have now is a bunch of competing objectives. On the one hand, we have the folks who really are interested in maintaining and uh, continuing the trophy fishery for blue catfish in our region. And then on the other hand, we have statements like those from the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission that basically say we need to think about the ecological consequences of this species in our system and what that means to the watermen who are targeting other species like blue crab, like striped bass, like croaker. So what can be done? Uh, shortly after the ASMFC declared it invasive, we put together an invasive catfishes uh, work group. Um, and I'm a member of that work group. And we got together and, and came up with a series of recommendations. And these are the recommendations. The companion paper that we're submitting from this will go into all of this in detail. But in the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to have to go quickly through this. So one of, one of the recommendations is we need to educate anglers and the public. They need to know that this is an invasive species. This is a, an image of a poster that the Maryland DNR created and has posted throughout the state of Maryland. And it basically says to anglers, if you catch one of these, do not release it back in the water. We need to establish consistent fishing policies and regulations across the region. Um, we need to monitor their distribution and status. We need to consider the benefits and risks of dam removal. Um, we need to remove fish from areas of significant ecological interest. And what we meant by that was areas that are uh, used for spawning and rearing of our native species, because we realize that we can't eradicate blue catfish from the Chesapeake Bay region. And then the last two focus on using harvests, um, <clears throat> either through small scale operations through the watermen, or developing a large-scale commercial fishery to reduce abundance of blue catfish in the region. And that's the idea that uh, Corbin talked about invasivism. If you can't beat them, eat them. And yes, this is from Whole Foods. I took this picture down in Newport News a couple years ago. They were $9.99 a pound. Now I think they're $10 or $11.99 a pound. So this has become a really popular um, item on the menu. Um, but the question is really, can, can this can this really work? Can we really uh, remove enough fish from the system to have an effect? And so um, I present here a couple of challenges. So first, one challenge that we have is we don't really have a stock assessment. Um, and as we heard before, each of these systems supports different populations. So we're talking about multiple stock assessments. Um, we don't have a population model, although Corbin is working on that, which I'm really glad. Um, because we need to understand how large a removal do we need to um, implement in order to be able to reduce abundance. The other um, challenge we have is that, as Vosker and I have demonstrated, there are compensatory responses in this species. Um, so even though we might be able to reduce the uh, abundance of these large blue catfishes in the system, and that might reduce the negative impact on native species, um, that may be offset by increased growth, growth rates and also greater reproductive output. And by that, we mean greater recruitment. Another challenge is that it looks like further range expansion <laughs> is likely as conditions are changing. Climate change in the Chesapeake Bay means we're going to have much more uh, wet conditions throughout the year. So um, further range expansions is likely. Anglers continue to translocate these fish. So again, the importance of communicating, uh, communicating with anglers that this is not a practice that is condoned. Um, environmental conditions are changing. These fish um, undertake long range movements in our systems, uh, much like they do in the Mississippi, Missouri rivers. And they have a tolerance to relatively high salinity. And they also have a tolerance to low food availability. So, uh, they pretty much can go wherever they want to now. So in conclusion, I think that catfish has the genie firmly in its grasp. Their catfish are here to stay in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, exploitation rates have been increasing, and this is good for uh, many of the small water, uh, watermen and operations that exist in the bay. Uh, but there still is a potential for further range expansion, and we still see these competing management objectives that haven't yet been resolved. Although, as Corbin mentioned, we are working towards re resolving those, and I'm really glad to see that we are making some progress on that. 
So I'd like to acknowledge the Invasive Catfishes Work Group led by Bruce Vogt. Um, we had a lot of great, great input from Mary Groves and Martin Gary, and then our funding from NOAA Chesapeake Bay Office, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, Virginia Marine Resources Commission, and Virginia Sea Grant. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you.